today's Citrus Research Exchange. I'm Brandi Nanaki. I serve as Research and Development Manager here at Citrus and the Bonato Institute. And I'd also like to mention that this is the 10-year anniversary of the Citrus Research Exchange. I'm very honored to introduce our Citrus Research Exchange speaker today, Dawn Song. She is a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science here at UC Berkeley. She is the co-founder of Oasis Labs, a team designing a platform to overcome the performance, security, and privacy limitations that hamper blockchain adoption. Her research interest lies in deep learning and security. She has studied diverse security and privacy issues in computer systems and networks, including areas ranging from software security, network security, database security, distributed system security, applied cryptography to the intersection between learning and security. A lot of security work. But I do want to acknowledge you are a very um, highly awarded person. Congratulations on that. Yeah, so let you. me say just a few of them, please. <laughs> she is a recipient of various awards, including the MacArthur Fellowship, the Guggenheim Fellowship, the NSF Career Award, the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship, the MIT Technology Review TR35 Award, the George Tallman Ladd Research Award. Oh, the, uh, it's a lot. You should be so proud of all of it you've accomplished, and we're so grateful to have you on faculty here at UC Berkeley. Thank you. Thank you but so much. I guess without further ado, Dawn, you now have the podium to give your presentation. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, everyone, for being here. It's my great uh, pleasure, honor to be here and to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the research that we have been doing and also some new technology that we are developing at Oasis, the new startup um, that uh, I'm working at, too. Um, so yeah, so I'll talk about Oasis, privacy preserving smart contracts at scale. So as we all know, data is a new oil. Uh, data, uh, we are collecting more and more data, and uh, this data is really valuable for us to extract insights from and also to help us make better decisions. However, a lot of this data is also very sensitive, and handling the sensitive data can create a lot of different challenges. So one, we continue to see really big uh, data breaches uh, where attackers compromise companies and they steal sensitive data about uh, hundreds of millions of users in each one of these attacks. And also at the same time, a lot of this data is being siloed. For example, it's difficult for medical researchers to gain access to medical data to help them do the medical research that they need, uh, largely because of the security and privacy challenges for handling sensitive data. And also, at the same time, we see that users are losing control of their data, as evidenced by the recent Cambridge Analytica uh, incident, for example. Towards addressing many of these challenges at Oasis, we are developing a new uh, technology and a new computing uh, paradigm that we call privacy-first cloud computing on blockchain, uh, which uh, enables a set of unique uh, capabilities, including a strong security and privacy protection, uh, providing high performance uh, to enable diverse cloud-scale applications ranging from games to machine learning, and uh, including uh, support for privacy preserving machine learning and data analytics. And we hope to achieve all this with the decentralized trust without relying on any central party. So, um, so first let me give you one concrete example of what kind of applications this type of technology can enable. And let's look at the domain of fraud detection. With the, uh, when banks give out loans that are providing financial services, they need to detect fraud. And typically how it works is that they, each bank will utilize its own data to build a fraud detection mechanism, uh, for example, training machine learning models using uh, its own data. But however, as we know that uh, for training machine learning model, the more data we have, the more diverse data we have, uh, typically the better uh, the machine learning model can be. And hence, it would be really nice to actually have other banks to be able to combine their different sources of data to build one fraud detection model together and uh, to help uh, other different banks to do better fraud detection. Of course, to do this, there are a number of challenges. Uh, one is, that, again, the data is really sensitive and has, there's a lot of security and privacy concerns, and there can be like misaligned incentives and so on. 
So this is enhanced, this is not done today. But however, we hope that uh, using technologies like uh, uh, what the Oasis blockchain can provide, we can pro provide a different type of approach, where on top of the uh, Oasis blockchain platform, we can have a fraud uh, detection uh, smart contract, where the smart contract can actually pull data from different data sources, for example, from different banks, and utilizing these different data sources to train a fraud detection model. And this way, uh, the hope is that then the fraud detection model can provide uh, better if, uh, efficacy uh, and can help banks to uh, do fraud detection more effectively. So in order to uh, enable this, we need to address a number of different challenges. So one, again, the data is sensitive, and hence as we compute over the sensitive data, for example, for training machine learning models and so on, we need to ensure that this computation process that does not leak sensitive information. And also as we uh, build, um, uh, for example, a train the machine learning model, uh, build a fraud detection model, we also want to ensure that the computation output here does not leak sensitive information. Because after all, the computation output uh, has been computed using uh, sensitive input to start with. And, uh, and also, here we need to deal with big data and big compute. And as many of you know, uh, the traditional blockchain platform actually has very limited scalability and has very poor performance and high cost. And hence, we need to address this issue as well to really provide the scalability and performance that's needed to enable these type of applications. So um, in order to uh, achieve this at Oasis, we are building new technologies uh, to support what we call privacy-preserving smart contracts at scale. And at the core of our technology, we provide um, a key primitive that we call privacy-preserving smart contracts. The privacy-preserving smart contract essentially is a smart contract that runs automatically on the Oasis blockchain platform, uh, we, uh, which satisfies a number of uh, unique properties. One is to provide automatic enforcement of codified privacy requirements. So the privacy policies here is actually encoded as code inside the smart contract and it's being automatically enforced by the Oasis blockchain platform. And we hope to achieve this uh, without relying on any central party. And also the architecture is designed to scale to real world applications including uh, data analytics and machine learning. And another very important uh, motivation for our uh, platform uh, and technology is that we want to make it really easy for application developers to build uh, privacy-preserving applications without needing to be a privacy or security expert. And hence, uh, we build in technologies uh, in the Oasis blockchain platform to enable application developers to make it easier for them to build privacy-preserving smart contracts without having to be a security or privacy expert. So now, let's look a little bit in more detail for the uh, component technologies that we develop in the Oasis blockchain platform to enable all these. The first is, um, right, so, so first, we, uh, when we look at the blockchain platform, so there are actually two, uh, two uh, layers. So one is a platform layer, uh, and there's the application layer on top of the platform where the smart contract sits. So at the platform layer, we uh, provide technologies for confidentiality preserving smart contract execution, uh, which uh, protects the computation process from leaking sensitive information. And at the application layer, we enable um, privacy preserving data analytics and machine learning. And uh, with the goal to protect the computation outputs from leaking sensitive information about the input. And uh, also at the platform uh, layer, we uh, design and build new architectures for the blockchain platform to enable scalable smart contract execution. So now let me just talk about each uh, component technologies uh, in a little bit more detail. So first, uh, let's look at confidentiality preserving smart contract execution. So, um, uh, the smart contract runs on top of the blockchain, and uh, 
usually, so users send you an input uh, at the request to the smart contract. The smart contract then executes uh, the request and transitions from the old smart contract state to the new state. And as you can see here, and also as most of today's blockchain platform, all these, uh, the, the input, the smart contract states, and the smart contracts, and uh, the computation itself, they all happen in clear, in the clear, and in public. And hence, there's no protection for sensitive data and compute. So in OSIS, we enable confidentiality preserving smart contract execution. So in this case, the input will be in encrypted form. And also, the smart contract states will be stored in encrypted form as well. And this encrypted input will be uh, sent to the smart contracts. And the smart contract execution uh, will happen uh, essentially on encrypted data and then transitions uh, the smart contract state from the old state to the new state. And one thing that's important that we want to ensure is that even though everything is encrypted, from, uh, so from the outside, you can't really see what has been executed. We still want to be able to provide a proof of correctness to make sure that the smart contract execution is correct. And to, in order to uh, enable this, uh, in the OSS blockchain platform, we leverage uh, different techniques for secure computation. The goal of secure computation is to protect the computation process from leaking sensitive information. And there are, uh, in general, two main different types of approaches for secure computation. One is um, using trusted hardware, uh, where uh, essentially utilizing hardware-based uh, mechanisms. And the advantage of this approach is that the performance is really good. It's often close to native performance, uh, and it can support for general purpose computation. And another type of uh, approach is um, crypto-based techniques, including secure multi-party computation and, uh, and other types of techniques. And the challenge for this type of uh, approach is that the performance overhead can be very high, often orders of magnitude performance overhead over native computation, and hence it can only be used for uh, limited use cases. Uh, in the OSS blockchain platform, we combine these different approaches to support uh, use cases um, uh, to be able to leverage the most suitable uh, approach according to the use case and the desired security and privacy requirements. So now let me just talk a little bit more about the uh, secure hardware. So the secure hardware essentially uh, is, uh, it utilizes hardware-based mechanism uh, to provide a fully isolated execution environment, usually called a secure enclave or trusted execution environment, T. So when we run a smart contract inside uh, this fully isolated execution environment, the secure enclave, then the outside, uh, for example, the operating system and also other applications will not be able to modify what's running inside and also will not be able to access what's running inside. And hence, um, uh, and hence the secure hardware can help provide integrity and confidentiality for the smart contract execution. And also the secure hardware can provide a hardware-based uh, mechanism for what's called a remote attestation which enables a remote verifier to remotely attest what has been running inside the secure enclave and its initial state, and hence to be able to verify the correctness of the computation. In our uh, research project and the recent paper, uh, Akiden, we are the first to, um, uh, to demonstrate uh, how we can utilize the secure hardware to enable confidentiality preserving smart contracts and also provide uh, a security proof for that. And by combining uh, these uh, secure hardware and, um, and blockchain, we can essentially uh, utilize and get the best of both worlds and provide much uh, stronger capabilities uh, for, to enable this confidentiality preserving smart contract execution. So secure enclave, besides um, enabling uh, the uh, uh, confidentially pre preserving smart contract execution, it actually also is a very strong, uh, can serve as a very strong cornerstone security primitive. Um, the secure enclave has very strong security capabilities, as we just discussed, and hence it can really help serve as a platform for building new security applications that couldn't be built otherwise for the same practical performance. So over the years, uh, 
uh, different hardware manufacturers have all recognized the importance of building secure hardware, and they all have built different uh, solutions uh, and, and deployed different versions of these solutions. However, there are still many challenges in building secure hardware. So one, how secure can it be, and under what threat models? And also, what would you entrust with secure hardware? Your Bitcoin keys, the financial data, or health data? And the ultimate question is, can we really create a truly trustworthy secure enclave that can serve as a cornerstone security primitive that is widely deployed and to enable secure systems to be built on top? If we can do this, then this can really um, help the whole community to usher into a new secure computation era. So what's the path to uh, trustworthy secure enclave? So first, we need to have an open source design. The open source design of a secure enclave can help provide the transparency uh, needed for the whole community to come together to analyze and verify the security and correctness of the secure enclave and to enable the high assurance needed for a secure enclave. And also open source helps build a whole community. Ideally, we would like to provide a formal verification of the security and correctness of the secure enclave. And we need to ensure the secure uh, supply chain management for the secure hardware manufacturing process. Towards these goals, we have been uh, designing and building a keystone for open source secure enclave. Uh, the keystone is a research collaboration between Berkeley and MIT. As, as a first step, the Keystone Enclave is built on top of uh, RISC V architecture. Uh, RISC V is an uh, open source uh, RISC architecture that has been developed at UC Berkeley <coughs> and has seen wide industry adoption. The RISC V Foundation has more than 100 members. And utilizing the hardware based capabilities provided by RISC V, it enables us to have a much uh, simpler and modular design for, um, for the secure enclave. And um, uh, for more details for the Keystone design, you can go to the website keystone-enclave.org um, and where we listed uh, the key goals uh, for building this open source uh, secure enclave. Um, and and also recently, we have hosted the first workshop on building open source secure enclave and uh, leading uh, experts and researchers from industry, including Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Intel, ARM, and also le uh, leading academic institutions all came together to, um, uh, to discuss and uh, with the common goal towards building an open source secure and performance enclave. And we hope to have an initial release uh, this fall uh, with uh, certain key components and capabilities. Uh, also, for our students here, this is a great project uh, to join as well uh, if they are interested in building or uh, contributing to uh, open source secure enclave. So that's the first uh, component technology for building confidentiality preserving smart contract execution. So now let me uh, talk a little bit about the second component technology on privacy preserving data analytics and machine learning. So when we, first, uh, let's look at some of the uh, challenges and uh, risks when we do data analytics and machine learning. So first, uh, when we do data analytics, um, so let's look at two example questions here. So for what, one question, we are asking how many trips were taken in New York last year um, for, for example, analyzing trip data. Um, and another question is how many trips did Joe take last week? As you can see, these two questions, in order to answer these two questions, they both require accessing to data. But however, the kind of information that they reveal uh, is very different. The first question reflects a trend, which doesn't really leak much uh, about uh, uh, individuals, whereas the second question very much uh, actually you know, leaks sensitive information about uh, individual Joe. And, uh, and hence, in general, you know, for, um, for uh, data analysts, they may want to uh, get answers to questions like the first type, uh, but they shouldn't actually be you know, able to answer questions of the second type. 
this is an example demonstrating that, uh, for example, traditionally the approach that has been used for protecting data privacy is access control, just to say that who can access to what data. But however, as you can see here, access control is insufficient. It cannot, access control cannot differentiate these two different use cases, which both need uh, access to data, but the one is desired and allowed, the other one is undesired and disallowed. It has access control, is not able to enable the use of data while at the same time protecting privacy of individuals. Also, you may have heard about the data anonymization, which is another technique that often uh, people often use for um, protecting uh, users' privacy. Data anonymization essentially try to modify data at the re uh, removing uh, sensitive information, uh, called PIs, and are uh, just uh, actually, uh, for example, perturb data. But however, data anonymization anima also is often insufficient. On one hand, um, it uh, can significantly degrade the utility of data, and also on the other hand, data anon anonymization has been demonstrated that often times it's not sufficient in protecting uh, users' uh, uh, privacy. Um, there has been work showing that, uh, research have shown that even uh, when you have anonymized data sets, uh, attackers can utilize publicly available data to try to de-anonymize these data sets uh, in what's called a re-identification attack to actually still uh, identify individuals from these anonymized data sets. As another example, um, so that's data analytics. So now let's look at another example in machine learning. So in our recent work in collaboration with the researchers from Google, we uh, explored the following question. So as we all know, deep learning has been very, very powerful uh, and effective in helping us solving many problems. Um, so one question is, as we train deep learning models, do these neural networks actually remember training data? And if they do, can attackers actually exploit this and extract secrets in the training data from just simply querying the learned models? So in our work, we showed that, uh, so this is one example case study. So in, in this case study, we train a language model from an email data set called an Enron email data set. A language model essentially is, um, uh, it's a model where when given a sequence of characters or words, it will predict the next character or the next word. And um, so in, in this email, uh, Android email data set, it, uh, it already contained actual users' credit cards and social security numbers to start with. And uh, our study showed that the attacker, by just querying the learned language model, uh, and by designing new attacks, the attacker can actually automatically extract the original credit card and social security numbers that were included in the original data set. And this is an example demonstrating that um, when we train uh, these uh, machine learning models, we really need to be careful uh, with protecting users' privacy because an attacker, in this case, through just querying the learned model can actually recover uh, sensitive data embedded in the original training data set. So luckily in this case, we have a solution. Our work showed that uh, instead of training a vanilla um, machine learning model, a vanilla language model in this case, instead if we train a differentially private language model, then, um, uh, then in this case, we can still achieve high utility, we don't lose much in utility, but we can significantly uh, enhance the privacy protection in this case, and our uh, uh, proposed attacks in this case actually no longer works. So what is differential privacy? So differential privacy is a formal privacy notion. Um, at the high level, what it says is that now let's consider uh, two, uh, data, two neighboring data sets, where one data set has one data point more than the other data set. And uh, as we, uh, for example, we say that a function is differentially private 
if when we compute this function over these two neighboring data sets, uh, the, com the computation results are almost identical. They are very close. So um, at a high level, what intuitively speaking, what this is saying is that the, um, uh, uh, that an attacker in this case, just by looking at the computation output, the attacker is not able to differentiate whether Joe's data point is used in the computation or not. And hence, uh, intuitively speaking, this is one way uh, to demonstrate that uh, a differentially private uh, function, in this case, uh, helps protect uh, Joe's uh, data because the attacker cannot even tell whether Joe's data was used in the computation or not. So uh, even though differential privacy is a very powerful privacy notion, but there has been very little real-world use of differential privacy. Um, and there has mainly been uh, targeted uh, usage for specialized applications in Google and Apple uh, for differential privacy. And to really enable uh, real-world deployment uh, for more general purpose, differentially private data analysis and machine learning, and there are a number of challenges. One, we need to enable usability for non-experts. Most of the data scientists, uh, data analysts, actually they don't know about differential privacy and they don't really know uh, what differential privacy mechanisms they should use given a particular workload. And we need to provide broad support for different types of analytics queries. And we need to provide easy integration uh, with the existing data environments. And no existing system addresses these issues. So in our collaboration with the Uber, we have um, developed uh, new, uh, new systems and techniques to enable uh, a practical uh, deployment of uh, differential privacy, uh, privacy preserving data analytics and machine learning. Um, so using our tools, uh, we can automatically rewrite data analytics and machine learning pipelines to automatically enforce the desired uh, security and privacy requirements. And some of our technology has already been deployed at Uber. So by combining confidentiality preserving smart contract execution and privacy preserving data analytics and machine learning, we enable um, privacy preserving smart contracts. So now let me uh, talk a little bit about how we enable uh, scalability. Uh, for scalable smart contract execution. So um, for scalability, there are actually different, uh, uh, different uh, aspects for scalability that we need to pay attention to. So most today, when people talk about scalability for blockchains, they focus on scalability for, uh, for high transaction throughputs for payment transactions. But however, um, uh, here, I would like to emphasize that uh, besides high TPS for simple payment transactions, it's also very important for us to enable scalability for more complex smart contract execution. So for example, um, as we uh, build applications for different uh, application domains, including healthcare, uh, financial services, and so on, um, these smart contracts are much more complex, and hence it's really important for us to enable uh, scalability for more complex smart contract uh, execution. So first, let's look at why uh, today's blockchain platform actually does not uh, provide scalability. Um, so when we talk about the blockchain platform, there are three key functions that a blockchain platform usually need to uh, provide. Consensus, how different parties reach agreement. Uh, storage to store the uh, transactions and uh, smart contract state, and compute how we enable uh, smart contract execution. And today's blockchain platform, usually they actually have the three key functions bundled together, and that's one of the main reasons that they don't uh, scale. So um, in the Oasis blockchain platform, we take a different approach, where we design a new architecture for blockchain platform, for scalability, and uh, for s complex smart contract execution, and that we call uh, separating execution from consensus. 
In particular, we uh, decouple these three key functions uh, for our blockchain platform into three independent layers, uh, the independent uh, consensus, storage, and compute layer. So this way, each layer can scale independently, and each layer can also uh, evolve uh, and improve independently as well. So the whole blockchain architecture uh, has a more uh, modular and uh, uh, a mo modular architecture to make the whole blockchain architecture uh, easier to evolve and improve. And also in this case, so by separating execution from consensus and decoupling these functions into different layers, we enable scalability. And also at the same time, we uh, use verifiable computing to enable uh, security and integrity for the, um, for the blockchain platform. In particular, the, um, the consensus layer will, will order the transactions, and the compute layer will perform the computation uh, for the smart con contract execution, and the consensus layer will then verify the correctness of the computation uh, through verifiable computing. And we utilize different approaches for verifiable computing, including majority vote, uh, vote and other techniques that I won't uh, go into details here. So to summarize, um, the, uh, here's the OASIS trust model. So the OASIS platform does not rely on secure hardware. Uh, the scalability and the integrity of the OASIS platform does not depend on secure hardware. The scalability of the OASIS platform comes from separating execution from consensus. And the security and integrity comes from verifiable computing. And the OSIS platform provides a unified secure computing framework where um, we provide, uh, we combine secure hardware and crypto based techniques to provide uh, flexible choices for developers and users to choose the best uh, secure computing techniques uh, for the applications, uh, for each application, depending on their use cases and the desired security and privacy requirements. And also, we hope that the open source secure enclave design can help provide a shared foundation for secure computing in the future. So now, let me give you one uh, example uh, application that an uh, application developer is building on top of the OASIS uh, blockchain platform uh, today, and that's called the CARA, a privacy-preserving tokenized data market for medical data. So as we all know, the medical data is locked in data silos. The goal is to incentivize doctors and patients to share data and improve medical research. And here, this is how uh, it works. So with Kara, uh, users and patients can upload their uh, medical uh, data to the OASIS blockchain platform. And uh, the data will be stored in an encrypted form. And a medical researcher can utilize a primitive provided by the OASIS blockchain uh, platform called the Privacy Preserving Smart Contract and to build their own uh, smart contract. And inside the smart contract, the medical researcher can include code for training machine learning models and for serving machine learning models. And the smart contract can specify terms of use. Uh, for example, how the, uh, the, user will only, uh, the data will only be used for training a privacy-preserving machine learning model inside the smart contracts. And they uh, will not be used for anything else. And also, the, they, uh, and also the smart contract can specify how uh, uh, the users will be compensated. So if a user agrees to the terms of use, uh, the user can then contribute uh, data to the smart contracts. And um, as the smart contract collects enough data, the user can then uh, train, uh, the, the smart country can then train the machine learning model, and the medical researcher can then evaluate the effectiveness of the trained machine learning model. So as you can see in this way, it can significantly reduce the friction for medical uh, researchers uh, and pharmaceutical companies to gain access to data uh, without, uh, uh, to help them to train machine learning models and uh, help them develop better cures for diseases, while at the same time protecting users' privacy. So this is just many examples, uh, 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 applications that can be built on a platform like the OASIS blockchain platform. 
And uh, now I want to uh, talk about another um, even more important uh, problem that uh, we hope that a technology like this can help solve in the future. So as many nation state leaders have already uh, recognized and stated, that whoever controls and leads in AI will rule the world. So the question is, who is uh, controlling AI today and who will be ruling the world tomorrow? So today we have big companies who are collecting user data and building personal profiles uh, for these, uh, 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 right, using uh, this personal data. And they use this, uh, uh, then they uh, build personalized services to provide to users. But however, the goal for these personalized services is to maximize company revenue. And also we have seen misuse AI for large scale automated and targeted manipulation. So the question is, is there a different future? Is there a different future where we can build intelligent agents and virtual assistants that are under user control? And these intelligent agents and virtual assistants under user control, they can provide the services to, uh, the, they can utilize third party services, and they will actually provide the personalized services to uh, individual users. And the difference here is that their goal is to maximize user value instead of maximizing uh, company revenue. We hope that uh, just like the example that I mentioned uh, in the healthcare space, we hope that with technology like uh, the Oasis blockchain platform, we can uh, enable um, intelligent smart contracts. So these are essentially uh, can be intelligent uh, agents uh, and even personal assistants that actually run on the blockchain platform that can help towards the long-term goal of democratization of AI. So recently we've launched uh, Oasis Labs and it's great to see the excitement and support uh, from the community. And also we have launched our private testnet that we invite developers and users to build on top of the platform uh, to enable new applications that couldn't be built before. And also we announced uh, a university fellowship as well to encourage and support uh, students and to uh, conduct research and development in a broad spectrum of different areas, including distributed systems, secure hardware, privacy preserving uh, technologies, uh, crypto and uh, machine learning and so on. And more information is uh, available on the Oasis Labs website. So to summarize, uh, at Oasis we are building a privacy first, high performance cloud computing platform on blockchain. Uh, we are also hiring uh, both for interns and also for full time. Um, with that, uh, thanks everyone. Hi, so we're going to open it up to Q&A. Um, there's uh, two mics on both sides of the auditorium, so just raise your hand and we'll bring, we'll bring you a mic. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the talk. So I'm trying to understand this consensus algorithm. So <laughs> the verifier on a blockchain somehow should, uh, they, don't, they are not the compute node, and compute nodes are off-chain. So they have to trust those compute nodes which are off-chain and it, those encrypted data that comes, how they know the, whether they, how they can verify it, whether they are. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so, so first of all here, uh, as I mentioned, so we decouple the layers, uh, the consensus, storage, and compute layer. So we don't really necessarily call it off-chain. Uh, so all these layers actually are integrated together to provide a layer one solution. And as I mentioned, so we utilize the uh, very proper compu computing uh, techniques so that the consensus layer will actually verify the correctness of the computation results from the compute nodes, from the compute layer. And uh, we utilize different types of computation techniques, including um, uh, majority votes and uh, discrepancy detection and other techniques. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, it, I think this is a little bit of a follow-up to that. I'm, I'm wondering, um, when in the cases where you're using hardware trusted execution environments, what are you getting from the blockchain at that point? If you already have trusted execution and, if, and you can pass the output through differential privacy, what does the blockchain give you? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that's a very good question. So really the blockchain, uh, it's the consensus layer uh, that's uh, what it gives you. So first of all, in our consensus layer, we actually don't use secure hardware. So it just, the consensus layer just uses the uh, the traditional, like we do proof of stake uh, consensus. If you did use your Risk V solution, for example, though, and you did have a formally verified solution, are, are you still getting significant benefit from the blockchain at that point? I see. So in this case, it really, it's about uh, what's the trust model. So that's why we, right, we decided for the, we can use the secure hardware to help providing privacy protection for the smart contract execution, but we do not use the secure hardware for the consensus layer. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. It seems like the smart contracts are going to require uh, input from perhaps multiple users. The input must be verified in order to uh, validate, uh, validate the uh, the uh, contract itself. How, are, how does the users present and assure the, the data to the uh, smart contract? Um, so uh, in this case, uh, as I mentioned earlier, so users essentially can send uh, inputs or requests to the smart contracts. And so it's just uh, like a typical smart contract execution, you send a request to the smart contract. And then the smart contract will take the input and then we'll do the smart contract execution. A really interesting talk, just a pragmatic question. Is there a test net and can we join it? Oh yes, as I mentioned, let me show this again. Uh, so we have a private test net and uh, uh, we, uh, right, we strongly recommend you to uh, just apply it on the website. So basically now um, we have actually um, you know, invited uh, many of the developers who have applied on the private test net to join our private test net. Um, yes. So again, another question. So if I understood all the I.O. are encrypted, where do you store those keys? Where do you store the key for encryption? <laughs> okay, that's a very good question. Um, so actually, we are actively working on different key management schemes. Uh, but in general, depending on the secure computing techniques that you use, so for example, if you are using secure hardware uh, for providing privacy protection for the smart contract execution, then essentially the keys are in the secure hardware. Hi, yes. Um, I was just wondering, if someone downloaded a bad file, how would you prevent attacking from on the inside? Okay, that's a good question. Depending on what you mean by downloading a bad file. Um, so are you talking about, so in this case, we have smart contracts and then different uh, developers uh, and users, they can upload uh, their smart contracts. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the smart contract will be executed in uh, isolated execution environments mm -hmm. to protect the, you know, the computing environment as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, thanks. Thanks for the question. Last question. Um, I, you mentioned Ethereum in one of your slides, and I was curious about decomposing the, your use of blockchain sort of in its disparate elements to, mm -hmm. to determine sort of the parts that were necessary. And uh, I can clearly see where consensus is necessary. Uh, I can see where the BFT part is necessary. Um, I was curious about the ledger part, and I was wondering, um, do you need the ledger part uh, or in, in smart contracts as well, as well of course. So uh, is, is there a simpler solution that l gives you the smart contracts and, and the fault Byzantine fault tolerance and the consensus but maybe it doesn't need the, the heavyweight part of the ledger along with that as well. Uh, so what you do, when you achieve consensus, essentially the goal of our consensus is to have a ledger in this case, right? It, could you just use sort of classic BFT techniques uh, in, instead of the ledger for consensus? I mean, when you do BFT, you, you also, you, you can use BFT to form a ledger, right? So the BFT, essentially the output from the BFT helps you to form a ledger. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, thanks. Great. Well, uh, please join me in thanking Don for an amazing talk. Thank you, Don.